Welcome to an explanation of the Catholic faith, session two, reading the Bible. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to begin again with a, a story. Actually, it's a true story. It's a story about a man who would push a junk cart, as they call it. He collected papers. He would take the cart and push it along and call out for newspapers. People would give him the old newspapers. He put them in the cart. And when the cart was filled, he would bring it down again to what was called a junkyard. And in the junkyard, he would receive $5 for each cart that he brought in filled with papers. And so he would go through the streets and when it came lunchtime, he would have an apple. There would be an apple there on his cart and he'd stop and he'd eat his apple. He had a long brown coat on and you could tell he was obviously a very poor person. But every day, he pushed that cart down the street. And there's a group of children who would really taunt him. They would really call out, apples, apples. That was the nickname they gave him. And he would make as though he's chasing them. He'd take a few steps in their direction. And they would run away giggling. One day, one of the children, a little older than the rest, playing in the park with his father. And as he was playing with his father, he noticed for a little bit away, another man playing with his children. That man happened to be the junk man, a little more clean dressed. You could tell the clothing was poor, but he was playing with his children. And that one child who would always taunt him every day suddenly realized he was somebody's father. And he felt very, very sad, very upset with what he had been doing to that poor man. So he realized that he was a human person like the rest of them. He understood him through his children, through the park, through his playing. The next time that he was pushing that cart through the street, the children began to taunt him again calling out apples, apples. But the child who was in the park and saw him playing with his children, he stopped the others and explained, he's human, he has children. So they stopped taunting him. The idea behind that little story is the idea that sometimes when we get behind a person as we see them and make our judgments right away, there's much more to that person's life that we don't know that really changes our view. They now saw that junk man apples in a different way. And the same thing happens now as we begin our study of the Bible. There are people who read the Bible a certain way. I'd like to begin by saying the Bible is not a book to be conquered. Somebody might say, well, you know, I read the Bible four times. But what did the Bible do for that person's life? What about sections of the Bible that answer certain needs we have at certain times in our life? So bragging or talking about, well, I read the Bible three, four times. It doesn't mean anything in one sense. So the Bible is not a book to be conquered. I brought with me a Bible. So the Bible is a big book, and we know that. And yet as we look at the Bible, we look and say, well, how could I possibly read that? And of course, we read a little bit at a time, perhaps take a year reading the Bible. But the real idea is read it so that it really touches us in some way. Learn a lesson from it. And that's why the Bible is there. 
to teach us a lesson. A question about the Bible that many people ask, was the Bible a single book? The answer, of course, is no. It's actually almost a library of books, a library of different kinds of writings. It actually has sayings, prophecies, letters, prayers. It has many things, hymns. All of these are found in the Bible, written by different people at different times in history. But then editors came along. They gathered together these stories. Originally, this or that story might be edited. And so we have all of these different books in the Bible, not one single book, but a collection of books. And so it's composed and edited by many people down through the ages. And as it is compiled and edited, it has really had a different way of seeing things. Each one of those editors are authors. They had a view of history from their surroundings. They lived at a certain point in history, thought like the other people of their own times thought. In this Bible that I just showed, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is much larger than the New Testament. And the reason is the Old Testament covers 1,500 years, whereas the New Testament approximately 100. So naturally, the Old Testament would be considered longer. Plus the Old Testament, that tells us about what life was like before Christ. The New Testament tells us about the coming of Christ, Christ's message, and who Christ was, and also how we should live as followers of Christ. So that's the Bible. The Bible is made up of these different sayings. The other idea behind the Bible is that when the authors wrote their Bibles or their books, what really happened is that they simply wrote it for others to read. They never identify themselves. They didn't write as we write today, for instance, this is a story by so-and-so. The author didn't always give their name. In fact, rarely gave their name. We have letters from Paul, of course. We know they come from Paul. But not all the letters attributed to Paul, the apostle, came from him. And so we have letters. We have John's letter to during the book of Revelation. He, he identifies himself as John. But who is John? And so we look back at these letters and we say, well, the authors didn't always identify themselves. Later on, some writers, some spiritual writers, some composers in many ways, they gave names to some of these. Well, it looks like this apostle, this follower, this person wrote this, this section of the Bible. So they, they said this person did it, but it's not necessarily true. There was no self-identity in a sense that the authors would write and say, this is written by. So names for the Bible writers comes later, sometimes wrong, sometimes correct. The idea behind it is that we have in the Bible those 1,500 years from the Old Testament. What is the Old Testament? The Old Testament is basically how the followers of God really learned about God, what was happening in their life. They learned about God from the way they lived, how God protected them, how God guided them. That's the Old Testament. That covers 1,500 years. The New Testament, as I mentioned, talks about Jesus and what we learn from Jesus and about Jesus. The word testament means covenant. So it's the old covenant and the new, new covenant. That's what makes up the Bible, the old covenant and the new covenant. So they have the Bible and it covers many centuries. It's not just a single book. So now we say, well, well okay. Why is the Bible so important? And the Bible is important because it's the word of God. What does that mean? It means God speaks to us in many different ways. 
God has to reveal certain things about God to us. We don't know everything about God. We cannot know everything about God. But there are things that we receive through the word of God that help us understand God during our life here on earth. So the first thing we say is the word of God, how, how can we trust it? We believe that the word of God is inspired. The Bible is the inspired word of God. It's the source of our faith. We live our faith based on the Bible. That's the primary source of our faith. The Bible itself, it comes from a community, how they lived, how God dealt with them. And they're community stories. The Bible tells us about this or that story in a person's life. Sometimes they're pure messages, how to live as followers of God. They originally, came actually from communities. They were given orally in speech. They would talk to the people. Picture the people of ancient times not having books. So they sit around, put a fire in the middle in the fireplace in the little pit in front of them. And they sit around and they listen to messages, listen to stories. And so the Bible develops from that angle. There are great prophets who come into situations in life and they have to say, this is the word of the Lord. God told me to give you this message. The community itself, when they praise God, they use hymns. All of these things are gathered together and it forms the Bible, but we believe they are inspired by God. So it, God inspired them. It doesn't mean that God dictated. Inspiration doesn't mean, well, God said to somebody, sit down and take a message. There's a book written, talks about Jesus and his apostles. At the end of the day, it pictures Matthew as getting up when everybody else goes to sleep. And Matthew writes out what happened that day. It didn't happen that way. The author themselves didn't hear God talking to them. In fact, the writings themselves have a different style. There's different words used, different images used. It shows that it's not one long book. However, it covers different periods of history, Old Testament history. The writers themselves were not aware that they were writing a scripture. They simply were expressing the community's response to what the community learned about God or what a prophet told about God. And so that's how they really developed this. It wasn't something that God said, okay, take a letter. They weren't even aware that eventually what they were writing would become part of scripture. Also too, when we read the scripture, we'll hear somebody say, well, you know, scripture says this or that. They take a quote out to prove their point. When we read the scripture, we have to realize every passage in the scripture that we use has to be in line with the rest of the scripture. What that means is that the scriptures are without error. Yes, it's the total scripture, not just the individual text. An example, Job he, he wrote, or whoever wrote about the book of Job, it was a wisdom book. Somebody spoke about this suffering man who lost everything. However, it also talks about the idea there's no life after death. It denies the idea of resurrection. And we look at that and someone could pull out that quote and show there can't be a resurrection. Job said so. But the fact is, it doesn't balance with the rest of the Bible. So it's, it's just one quote, one excerpt, comes up several times perhaps, but then there's no talk about resurrection because there was no belief in resurrection. The idea of resurrection from the dead really began about 150 or so many years before Christ. 
Before that, it was suspected by many of the writers. They wrote about it. But as a community accepting it, it really might have taken up to about 150 or a little longer before Christ. So the idea being, we has to be compared to the total scripture. We know that Jesus talked about resurrection from the dead. So we have to compare what was said by Job to what was said by Jesus. And we find out, well, what was said by Job really began to change as history went on, even before the coming of Christ. People began to believe in resurrection and reflect on resurrection. So the idea behind it is that we have to take individual passages and compare it to the rest of the Bible. What that means is that someone cannot come up to us and say, well, the Bible says this. They give us one quote. What does the total Bible say? What is the total message of the Bible? That's what we go by. Another reason the Bible is so important, as I said already, it's divine revelation. It is God revealing to us. There's mysteries about God that we do not know. Some mysteries, for instance, God guides us. Do we know that God guides us? Are we aware of God's guidance? So we know that God guides us. But now in scripture, we read about it. We know that God loves us. And then I read about God's love. And I say, aha, my feeling, my belief is proven by the Bible. It's revelation. Revelation is saying God is a loving God. That's revelation. In ancient times, they saw different gods. Some of the gods were angry gods. Some of the gods were happy gods, enjoyable gods, helpful gods. But the idea now, we know we have a loving God. One God. That's revelation. Revelation is saying there is one God. And for instance, some revelation, we believe that Jesus is God. That is revelation. It was revealed to us. There are certain things we cannot know by using our human mind alone. We cannot know that Jesus is God by human, using our human mind alone. We need the revelation. We need to say, well, I suspect that. And as I read the Bible, it's saying to me, it's true. Jesus is God. And then we have something that's called tradition. Tradition means that the acts of the apostles, the words of the apostles, the followers of Jesus, they were faithful to his message. In the Old Testament, the prophets were faithful to God's message. But then what happens is when the last of the apostles or those who are close to the apostles died, then they said revelation ended. What that meant was that after this, there was no new public revelation. Public revelation means it comes from Jesus directly or indirectly by those who know him or were connected to the others who knew him. It lasted to about 100 years after Christ came. So by that time, all the apostles had died. All the followers of the apostles had died. And so now those who can say, well, yeah, that, that message really happened. They also die. That's the end of public revelation. No way to remain faithful by witnesses. And so what happens now, we have what's called private revelation. Private revelation of visions. Visions where, let us say that St. Joseph appears to someone and says, do this. Does the church have to suddenly say, oh, we all have to do it, all Christians? No, we all have to do that because St. Joseph appeared to so-and-so. No. That's private revelation. That's for that person and whomever decides to believe that God visited that person. It is not a direction to the whole church. Public revelation has ended. 
But then there are things that happened in faith that really we don't find in the scriptures as such. For instance, the community began to grow. Many people were being baptized. What was the process used for baptizing? So we look back to the early church. The early church, the early disciples of Jesus, or even how some of the people really lived who believed in God, but not the fact that Jesus brought this message. We look back into the Bible and we say, what does the Bible tell us? We have to face many new situations today, situations that didn't exist in Jesus' day, situations that are confusing, but somehow we take those parts of the public revelation, we apply them. If there is no contradiction, in fact, things lean in this direction, then we begin to accept it. That's tradition. Tradition is the way people acted on the truths that Jesus gave them and Jesus writers gave us people in the Old Testament. How do we live it? And then what is lived in life based on that, but not contradictory to that? That's tradition. To say tradition, it's really the overarching idea. Tradition means what, what's happening. Take, for instance, that everything that we have comes from tradition. The apostles, they learned from Jesus and they shared it with others. And what was happening there is that they were developing tradition. They existed first as members of a community. And as members of the community, they shared what the community was teaching. The community's teaching was tradition. So we have the New Testament, Old Testament from another different angle. So what's happening is that tradition is how we can keep the faith going as we reach each new conf conflicting or challenging thoughts in our modern world. So tradition, it's always going on, always being applied, always trying to be understood. And sometimes we say, well, this tradition, it, it was wrong. Then it wasn't totally in union with the tradition of the church. So there, there's some ideas that really just simply say the church is built on scripture and tradition. And that's why we can read some things that really tells us how the early church lived and acted, or how the people of the Old Testament lived and acted. And so they had to make their own decisions sometimes. So then what happens now when we read the Bible? How do we read the Bible? We have to try to understand that the Bible was not written in the 20th, 21st century. The Bible was written thousands of years ago in a completely different culture that many of us are familiar with. There was a different style of writing. Historical writing as we have it today really didn't exist. There was some hints of it, but it really didn't exist as we understand it today. So we go back and we say, well, what, what did they do? How did they write? How should we read the Bible? So one of the things about the Bible is to realize it comes from an Eastern culture. At least it began mainly or grew through Palestine. It grew through that whole culture that was going on a Semitic mentality, Semitic, a way of thinking, a group. So it was a mentality different from ours. The Semitic mentality was a storytelling mentality it could take true facts and put them in the middle of a story. Or it could really take true facts and put them in a story in the sense of almost making the story up. So they could have historical facts in there and they did. But at the same time, they could also teach us through stories. Mythology. Mythology is taking a truth and then building around that truth. Mythology is not a fable. 
mythology is something different. It's usually a story told with a true message, a message that captures how we act, think as human beings. But then inspired mythology, we might call it, is the Bible. So what do we learn about reading the Bible? One of the first things we learn is that it's a literary form, a form of literature. So when we pick up the Bible, we should not expect to read history as we do today. We go back and try to understand their way of thinking. Their way of thinking. We today have different ways of thinking for something familiar to us. For instance, if I pick up a newspaper, I read on the first page that this country bombed that country. Terrible news, bad news. Then I go to the sports page and I read that one team in baseball has bombed another team yesterday's game. The word bomb is used twice in two different ways because they're two different literary forms. The first is factual, factual history, the world. The other is factual, but it's factual in a sense, a ball game. So it's a different literary form to present a message. So we fall into that. If I open up the newspaper and see that a certain pill will cure arthritis completely, I don't run out and buy that pill. What happens is I say, well, it's an advertisement. They exaggerate. The literary form immediately says to me, that's an advertisement. I accept it that way as I go through the newspaper. As we go through a newspaper, we come across all these different literary forms. Now we go back into the Bible. And in the Bible, we have to say, well, our mindset has to be changed to some degree. We have to understand that the writers of the Bible could be storytellers who are teaching facts in the form of story. They really are true. The facts themselves inspired by God. But the idea, the story that conveys those facts might never have happened. And so we begin to unravel some of the ideas of reading the Bible. How do we read the Bible in a different culture? So we begin, for instance, with the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. So the first 11 chapters are what writers would call prehistory. It means it predates history. However, it teaches facts, teaches spiritual facts by using stories. And also it depends on the writers, what their background is. We can have writers of a certain age of history, certain epic era, and they're writing something, but they might be far apart. There might be some, for instance, as in the book of Genesis, some called priestly authors, very concerned about the way people act, <clears throat> concerned about how God has made this whole universe a type of temple. Then we have some very human authors. They want to speak about God as walking in a garden, being part of their life. So two different approaches. So we have the literary form in the reading of the Bible. As we read the Bible and read it closely at the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis, we soon discover that there are two stories of creation. And the way we had two stories of creation is that in one era, one story of creation was taught. In another era, another story of creation was taught. Then an editor came along, found these two different stories. And instead of saying, which one will I choose? Simply said, well, let's put them together. Let's do one and then the other. As you read the book of Genesis closely, you find out that there are two separate stories of the creation of the world. Chapter one to chapter two, verse four, that's one, one story of creation. Chapter 2, verse 4, down to the coming of Abraham. That's another story of creation. 
takes us into chapter three. So we see those stories and we say they're written by different authors with different attitudes. If I were to ask someone, well, tell me, did God create humans first, human beings, or did God create animals first? Using the creation stories, we could not answer that question. The reason is the first story says human beings are created after animals. The second story of creation says, well, human beings are created first and they name the animals. God says, not good for a human being to be alone. Let's give him help, Mason. The first one is animals. That doesn't work, of course. And God realizes human beings need someone equal. And so God creates woman. The idea behind it is not that a woman is less, but the idea behind that is to simply say, she's not made from the dust of the earth. The man, the human being, is made from the dust of the earth. But the woman is part of man, really sharing equally with the man. That's what's meant to be taught there. So understanding the story, understanding the mentality, the way of thinking, the culture, and the literary form used. So take a moment and look at the first book of Genesis. The first book of Genesis talks about First, the creation of the world, chapter one to chapter two, verse four. It presents God as a God of order. The whole world is a watery mass. It's chaotic, chaotic. And God now puts order into that chaotic situation, to that water. And so it happens on the first day. God simply creates light and darkness. So the world becomes light, the world could become dark. On the second day, God takes a large dome and puts it over this land, whatever it is. And that dome keeps that water up there from falling down on us. In ancient times, rain came from there, of course, it still comes from there. But they saw it as floodgates of heaven. God opens up the floodgate, lets water through, and closes it. That's blue. That's what water is, blue. So they, they saw the universe as water above and water below. And this great dome, the creation of the sky. So in between, you have this emptiness, the sky. And then we have the third day of creation, creation of land. Very orderly creation. Then we have, well, all these things came, but what do we do with them? So we have, first of all, light and dark. We have emptiness and empty space, and we have land. So that's one, two, three, for a second, third day. The fourth day, what gives light on the first day? Sun, moon, and stars. So they're created now. And then on the second day, we have that great emptiness, the dome. Then what goes is birds of the air into that dome. Something to fill the, the air. On the third day in the one, two, three, compute filling of land, we have land. But what goes on to that land? Human beings, animals, etc. And then we have an image of God. God is a good Jew. That Bible story, first one, was probably written when people were practicing the Sabbath. It is a day of rest. Even God rested on the Sabbath. Then we reversed it. The reason God, we rest on the Sabbath, the people said, is because God rested on the Sabbath. But we look at that and we see a certain order in this. So God creates the world in six days, and on the seventh day, God rests. The first three days are days of separation. God separates from light from darkness, sky from uh, water from up above, from water below, third day land from water. Then it's kind of a habitation of these things. Sun, moon, and stars, what gives that sun? What gives light? Sun, moon. On the second day, 
God creates this dome. What is it for? Birds of the air. And so that's a parallel day. And so we see a parallel day, third day land, sixth day human beings. That's purposely done by the writer. It doesn't mean that this is how God created the world. Sometimes people try to say, well, God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, God rested. A day wasn't the day that we know them now. That could have been a longer time. We don't have to explain that. The author never intended us to explain how seven days would work. They simply were saying God is a God of order, and God created the world in order. Now we come to a different author an author who knew nothing about the first story of creation. In fact, the second story actually predates the first story. It was written first. But the second story begins with everything being in emptiness. So not chaotic like the first one, but everything is empty. And into all this emptiness, God produces a wonderful garden, the garden of paradise. So everything is there, fruit trees, etc. It's a garden of paradise. And human beings, when they come, are going to learn something about this garden of paradise. And so what does God do? God puts a human being into this garden of paradise. And God then shows dominion over the plants and all the animals by having the human being name the animals. But then God also needs someone equal to the human being to satisfy the human being. So God creates woman. And so God now creates woman and the two shall become one. If one leaves the other families in order to become one marriage. So it's a story about marriage. It's an inspired story about marriage. Chapter one and chapter two are both inspired. The world is created by God. God is an orderly God. So that's what happens. So now we have human beings and they're given everything. It's a wonderful creation, it's paradise. So they look around, wherever they look, they see something wonderful, but there is one tree from which they cannot take its fruit. And ironically, it's set in the center of the garden. It means it's the center of the life. It becomes more enticing. And what happens now is a serpent comes. The serpent was really symbolic in those days of fertility rights, false rights. It was looked down upon by those who are believers in God when this story was written. So serpent comes, and a serpent tempts Eve, Eve the woman tempts her by something that's going to control human beings in so many ways. If you eat of this fruit, you will be like God. That's why God doesn't want you to eat of it. Once you eat of it, you'll know about good and evil. You'll be like God. The desire to be like God. It's been with human beings for a long time. It seems to be the thing that controls us in so many ways. We want to be in control of everything in creation. We want to be like God. And so Eve, of course, now we see as the story goes on, Eve takes of the fruit. They had the whole garden, but Eve takes of the fruit. Human beings are given a paradise. Actually, this world is paradise. God has given us all kinds of gifts, but some take this gift, the forbidden fruit, and they take that. Many, many gifts in the world, but they choose the one tree. And so we see the symbol of it. We see the message of it. We dig into it and see what the authors are saying to us. That's the story of creation. That's the story that really is saying, well, look at the story. Did Adam and Eve exist as individuals? No, most likely not. It's a story that was told by people who didn't know how the world began. But as a community, they came together and they said, well, it must have begun with a man and a woman. And so they interpret what they know and do it that way. 
How did the world begin? We don't know. And so what happens now? Where do we turn? We turn to science. We'll say a little more about science in a while. But we look at this and it's saying that's how God created the world. And so the story of Adam and Eve is a story told to teach a message. The message is inspired. Same thing, the creation of the world. A story told to teach a message. It tells God as the great builder. That's the first story of creation. The other tells about God who strolls in the garden. God is strolling in the garden in the second story of creation. And says, Adam, where are you? Adam has hidden himself because he recognized he was naked. And God said, who told you you were naked? What he's really saying is now human beings have a certain shame, hide themselves from God. Now the struggle goes on. And so they're hiding themselves from God. Then as the story continues, we see where everything continues. And now sin follows. Adam and Eve, they have a son, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel, a sin. And Cain, God protects Cain, says, okay, I'll send you to a city where the people will take care of you. Where'd the city come from? The writer, we'd say, well, the writer says, I'm not concerned about that. Then we follow the story. It almost sounds like mythology. The sons of God marry the daughters of men. It means the sons of God from mythology. They spoke about sons of God. And so they married the world, human beings. And then the world gets so bad that God is saying, well, let's try again. And so God chooses Noah. And Noah builds the ark and saves his family. Again, these are the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, or well, should rather the chapters after Adam and Eve sin. So we see now the world has become so bad, it's sunk so far in sin that God says, well, I'll try again. And so it happens, the flood comes. No sooner, it seems, does the ark land and everything is clear that one of Noah's sons commits a sin. He laughs at the nakedness of his father, which is terrible in those days. To ridicule one's parents, that's the worst sin after ridiculing God. And so what happens now, he's exiled from the family. He goes and he establishes a whole new generation, the Canaanites, but we see where now the separation happens. We don't follow that historical development. But Ham is cast out of the family. So then what happens eventually, time goes on. And now we see where people are trying to get to God on their own. It didn't happen yet. And so they're looking to these great towers. Let us build a tower and climb through that dome to God. And God is saying, as though God is a concerned human being, if we don't mess up their tongues, if we don't confuse them, they'll be able to do anything. So what happens is now they begin to have different languages. So the people of Israel, they realized there were others who spoke different languages. How did this happen? The Tower of Babel. They were living in Babylon. They were in exile in Babylon when this story was told. So they're talking about a Tower of Babel. We have English words, of course. What are you babbling about? So we use those ideas. So this is the story now of the creation and how the Bible can be read and how we read it again through the eyes of the culture in which it was written. Then what happens, chapter 11, midway through it, along comes Abraham. And we follow the history of Abraham. Abraham is a man of faith. Again, the Semitic mentality, they can write something. Part of the story of Abraham is, is historically true, apparently. But there are other parts that are legend. Legend about this great man, Abraham, who was a great man in the eyes of the people. He walked with God. He spoke with God's angels, visitors. So that was Abraham. God chose Abraham, promised Abraham he would have 
offspring as numerous as the stars. So Abraham becomes the father of the Israelite nation. Abraham has two sons, Isaac and Jacob. Isaac and Jacob receive the inheritance from Abraham, the inheritance of God's blessings, the chosen people. So now they're set up, and then Jacob has 12 sons. And among those sons is Joseph. Joseph is sold into Egypt, lives as a slave for many years, interprets a Pharaoh's dream, and is put second in control of Egypt. He invites his whole family to a section of Egypt where they go and they settle and they continue to develop. They continue to multiply. Finally, along comes a Pharaoh who doesn't know where all these people came from. Many years have elapsed, 400 years. And now he has all these people in one section, the Hebrews. And he's afraid they're going to overtake Egypt if he doesn't do something. So he puts them into slavery. So they're living in slavery. Moses, he's one who was supposed to be killed as a child. The Pharaoh said that all Jewish children at a certain age should be put to death. Moses is saved because the Pharaoh's daughter saves him by finding him floating in a some kind of a mesh container or something. And so he's saved. And he's raised in the court, the Egyptian court. He becomes a guard. And one day he kills someone who's attacking one of the Israelite slaves. And he has to flee. And so he flees to the land, to Sinai Desert. He marries and he's a sheep herd. So he takes care of the sheep. But then God appears to Moses in a burning bush a bush that's burning but doesn't burn up and tells Moses he wants Moses to go back to Israel and free the people. Moses objects and God says, I'll be with you. And Moses, who should I say sent me? God says, say, I am sent you. So Moses goes back. His brother Aaron becomes the speaker on his behalf since Moses declares, I'm not a good speaker. Finally, they're able to convince the Pharaoh to allow them to flee from Egypt. They flee from Egypt, spend 40 years in the desert, all the Hebrew people and all their animals. And now in the desert, they finally reach the promised land, but they don't win yet. Moses dies and Joshua becomes the leader of the people to lead them into the promised land. They're able to settle in the promised land after certain wars. And finally, when they settle in the promised land, they now begin to develop their own culture, their own way of life. And they recall many of the things that happened. And they tell these histories. At times, they'll put some legend into those histories. They'll tell the legendary stories as long as the real stories. So it's partially history and partially legend. So many years go by, and they finally, they have the Assyrians invading a portion of the people, and then another, the Babylonians invading the southern section. They're put into exile in Babylon, a terrible persecution. Others have fled to different areas. That's called the diaspora, the dispersion. So some went to Egypt, some went to another area, some went to Asia Minor, but then others were captured and sent to Babylon, where they spent 50 years in captivity. Finally, Cyrus comes along, the Persian, and he frees them. They go back into their country. Some of them, some don't go back. Some say, well, Babylon, it's all I know. I don't want to go back. So it's what they grew up with. It's that the land they're familiar with. So finally, what happens in the... Palestine, they rebuild, but they're having a difficulty because the Persians are conquered by the uh, Greeks under Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great lives to be not very old. And finally, when he dies, there's a fight and his kingdom is split up among others. And the Palestinian people 
the one who is in charge of that area wants to impose Greek culture and to accept Greek culture for the Israelites would be to reject their own God. Finally, as time goes on, we read in the Book of Maccabees, the big fight that goes on to recover their land. They recover their land and they have the great feast of Hanukkah, the feast of the lights. The light of Christ is now part of their land. About 50 years before Christ, 60 years, um, they're having a problem. It's gradually growing for many decades. And finally, they invite the Romans in to help them, but the Romans take over. And now we have the end of the Old Testament era with the people of Israel under Roman rule. And so that's what happens in the Old Testament. We'll be talking about that a little more in our next meeting. But the idea there is that's how everything developed. That's how the Bible was written and the stories of the Bible came down to us. It's certainly a synopsis I shared, 1,500 years I just shared with you. But the idea behind it all is to get the mindset, to realize the Bible now is filled with messages. We'll give an overview when we meet the next time about who the prophets were, what the value of the prophets were, and what they did for the land of Israel. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, the word of Christ instruct me, the shelter of Christ protect me, the hand of Christ hold me, and the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me, the sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.